Hello everybody, welcome back to Office Hours. I'm Matthew Groves and I'm back. I was gone last week for that conference and I wasn't really able to do any streaming, but I am drinking some delicious that conference happy camper coffee. And uh, just forewarned, I will be on the road again starting tomorrow. Um, I'll be traveling through Michigan on my way up to Beer City Code. I'm going to hit some user groups. It's going to be fun. Uh, not this conference, it's that conference. Um, but uh, so the uh, next streaming is on Friday. Um, I potentially, I will not be traveling. I will not be uh, at a user group uh, during my normal streaming time on Friday. So I'm thinking about if I have time to get together to load up my laptop with some streaming software and maybe do a stream on the road. Of course, I won't have my green screen with me. I guess I could bring it, but um, it could be in a hotel room, could be in a hotel lobby. I don't know. It could be in my could be in my rental car for all I know. So uh, look for that. It may or may not happen. But what is going to happen is today I'm going to catch up. Um, that conversation could be awkward. What, the, in the lobby or in the rental car or what? <laughs> or, oh, about the conference, yeah. Hey, boss, can I go to that conference? I'm like, well, which conference do you mean? Yeah, I think, I think that's actually uh, the reason he called it that. <laughs> Just to get a Abbott and Costello type of thing going. <laughs> but that conference is in... Uh, Wisconsin. It's uh, called the Summer Camp, Summer Camp for Geeks. Uh, <laughs> and it's a fantastic conference. And uh, this year was no exception. And it's growing back up to the size that it was before 2020. It is not quite there yet, but it's getting there. And um, everyone was very positive about the direction it's going back into. And so I'm excited about it as well. Um, very eventful week, I should say. Uh, in a number of different ways, but I uh, had a great time. I was at the Couch Base booth. I had a, a, presented a session, uh, did some interviews, um, hung out with my peeps, my my fellow geek campers, had uh, game nights, had the big pig roast, just a very, a very good conference. And uh, that's put on by, well, a whole team, but Clark Sell is the uh, creator of it. And I was going to have an interview with uh, Clark on the live stream, but uh, that didn't happen. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. All right. Today. So I, I wasn't able to stream last, the week before that conference because the internet, my house went out. It was out like all day. It was out until the evening because of some storms in the area. So uh, I didn't have any internet. But what I was able to do, however, is even without internet, I was able to spend some time that evening, um, maybe even during the day, I can't remember when I did this, maybe over the weekend, I don't know. But I was doing some test refactoring because my tests, I thought, were getting a little bit hard to read, hard to maintain. So I'm going to go over that today. Uh, those are in the repo now. And there's some other tests that I was working on during that conference as well um, for testing the controller actions themselves. Uh, a full integration testing. So almost like a functional test where it's just, we're starting at the very entry point of the end user and testing everything that that endpoint uses. So I wouldn't quite call it a functional test because it's not like I'm actually using the AI or uh, anything like that. It's still automated. It's still being consumed, but it's testing the whole stack. So maybe it is functional test. I don't know. I'll, I'll let you decide. So then I'm going to, after I go over that, actually I have, do have one test I need to fix. And then I'm going to finish the Git profile endpoint because I do have the following information in there now. So I can finish that endpoint. And then once that's done, um, move that tag over and then I'll work on the unfollow endpoint, which is going to be very similar to the follow endpoint. And then I'm going to discuss something, which is the follow document. Um, and we'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, that's going to be an important question to decide, like, you know, which... What's the best approach for this? What's going to have the least impact on the database, least impact on the user's experience? Uh, what's, what's the best way to go there? So I hope you all hang out and join me and uh, follow along with your comments or questions, suggestions. Um, you know, 
Surly Dev with your harassment and your and your jokes. I always welcome those as well. We have fun here. This is a this is a channel for anyone who is interested in coding. Uh, so if you have what you think is a dumb question, please do not consider a dumb question. As I always say, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. So throw that question in there. Happy to do it. We also we've discussed like career advice in this uh, stream before. We've discussed. Um, other languages, you know, I'm using C Sharp, using .NET, using Couchbase, uh, using ASP.NET, and a bunch of other .NET open source tools, but open to discussing anything, so throw those questions in the chat, happy to talk about them, but let's get started. Okay, so I did some test refactoring, as I mentioned. Um, dumb questions are easier to fix than making dumb mistakes. That is a very good point, Shirley Dev, absolutely. That's really in the same spirit of, of uh, that same saying, so... Yeah, if you ask the dumb question, um, that's okay. Um, because if you don't ask the question, you could make a mistake. Right? Uh, so, yeah, it's much easier to fix that. Just like it's easier to fix code before it's in production. Uh, so it's always good to catch those bugs before you deploy it. Playful jibing? Playful jibbing? How do you say that? Yes, yeah, certainly, Dev. Uh, harassment is uh, maybe too strong a word. Uh, anyway, so here, this is the this is the test in the current state. So uh, as you can, I don't know if you remember the other tests, but these are much slimmer tests. In fact, why don't we bring up a a diff here, and you can see the difference here. So this is in tests, and integration, and this is a, a users, handlers, get current user request handler tests. Request handler, yes, okay. So we're going to do a, a diff. So you can kind of, oh, well, not with that version. Let's see. Let's do a uh, show log. And uh, yeah, here we go. Okay. So the test on the left is the old one, and the right is the new one. So on the left, you can see that that test is pretty long. We're looking at uh, 40 lines of code, something like that. And the one on the right, the current state is now down to maybe 20 lines of code. So just making it shorter makes it more readable, I think. Um, as long as it, it's not like code golf where we're trying to compress it down to like single letter variables, right? Uh, the shorter it is, generally speaking, the easier it is to read and understand. So how did I do that? Well, for one, I noticed that a lot of these tests, this, um, let me zoom it on here, let me zoom it here because sometimes this is hard to read in this font. A lot of these tests, I'm getting this collection provider in every single test, um, which, you know, is fine because it could be a different provider for each test, like users for here, maybe articles for a different one, and so on. But um, it doesn't need to be in the test, right? That's more of a setup step. So I moved it up to the setup method, okay? Uh, arranging the handler, again, this is more of a setup thing. So I moved that arrange the handler up into this setup. And if I want to write more tests, this will actually be good because then I'll be able to reuse the provider, reuse the handlers. Um, the arrange that didn't uh, that didn't change. Uh, I don't think. No, it, it didn't change. So the request here is still the same. Uh, but notice here that one of the parts of this test is actually put a user in the database ahead of time, so that the we're testing the get current user, so it has to be a user in the database for this to work. And so what I did was I had a bunch of this kind of lower level code in here where I'm going to the Couchbase collection, I'm creating a, I'm doing an insert, and then putting that user in the database. And then the act and the assert don't change. So what I actually did was I created this helper called create user in database. And this is an extension method on the collection provider that has a bunch of parameters. These are all optional parameters. They default to null. These are all the different characteristics of a user. Uh, and this one actually uses this create user. So this is some additional helpers. Um, but this is a helper method here. This creates the user in memory. And again, it takes all these parameters. But what it does is it goes through each of those parameters. And if they're set to null, then, then populate them with something that is a sensible default. Right, and uh, something relatively random each time, right? So if there's no username specified, then create a user with user dash, you know, random string. If there's no email, then create an email, random string at example.net, and so on. 
and it'll take all these default values and then doing some salt and password stuff and create the user that way. So I don't have to put this logic in my test anymore. All this, you know, kind of default randomly generated data in my tests. I let the helper do that. Um, and uh, if I do that, then all I have is this one line here where I actually end up putting the user in the database. Now, the thing is, well, you might say, well, sometimes I don't want randomly generated data. I want some specific data in there. And that's, that's kind of how this pattern works here. This is a, a helper pattern or um, my, my, my old boss, Seth Petrie Johnson, I think he called this the mother pattern, where we're going to create these objects. And you can actually specify, if, if you want a specific username, then put it in there and set it. So in this case here, I'm setting the username to something specific because uh, this is what I, I needed um, for this test. I'm actually not sure if I really do need this. Well, yeah, because I'm doing a, a test at the end because I, I need to keep this as a separate variable, but I'm passing it in here. And so when I create the user in a database, it's going to create everything with sensible defaults except for the ones that I give it, the values I want to specify. So this makes it a very slimmed down way to create objects. And it turns out, and I keep refactoring the other tests, this helper came in very handy in multiple tests. So I was doing that same kind of logic everywhere. This like generate a user string, username string, and email and a bio and things like that. That doesn't really add any value to the test. So having them in the helper here kind of abstracts it away, makes these tests smaller, easier to read, and a little more intent in the name as well. Create user and database. It's very clear what that means, putting user into the database. But it's only uh, this helper is only in the test project. So I can't use this from, I, I, should, I shouldn't want to, but I can't use this from the main web project. This is only for tests. So it's not going to have the level of validation and business logic that the actual database code will have, which is fine. It doesn't need it because we're, we're needed just for tests. So uh, I think this test is much slimmer, much easier to read. Um, and I'm much happier with him. Okay, so that's, I've, I've done that with all the integration tests. I probably still need to do that with the uh, unit test. It probably could be refactored as well. But the other tests that I've done is I started, I was curious about writing some tests against the controllers themselves. So if we go back to the web project, here's a user controller. These are the endpoints that uh, the front end will be calling. And these are the ones that are documented. These are the ones that appear in the, in the open, Open API UI, the, the swashbuckle, the swagger. Um, and these are very, very slim methods, right? They basically are just getting, taking in a model, passing that model to a mediator, and then interpreting the results as various HTTP codes. But I thought, even though they're slim, there's not much there, it's still worthwhile testing them. Um, but not just them in isolation. That, probably not a very valuable test. So I wanted to test... Uh, as if uh, this endpoint was being called by an end user or by a front end. So that is where Web Application Factory comes into play. And I just learned about this because I'm, I'm working on, uh, I'm helping review a book uh, about, uh, even a couple books actually, about uh, ASP.NET and uh, .NET and the refactoring. And this is one of the things that was brought up and I wasn't aware of this. So this is actually makes it a whole lot easier to do this kind of testing. So I, I basically just create a web application factory. I give it my startup, my program, and it creates, it spins up a whole ASP.NET server basically in memory, which is where it usually is, right? But uh, in memory, and then I can start creating, uh, I can create a client to send requests to that um, application. And so what that looks like is down here, I'm just saying, okay, uh, make a request to this endpoint with this payload. And it's going to go and run through the controller as if it were a real ASP.NET web server instance. And it kind of is, right? And so I can do a very like high level, almost black box testing of these controllers where basically whatever I pass in, in this case, I'm passing in various combinations of null and empty string for the logins. And what that should do is that should lead to certain validation errors, like email address must not be empty and password must not be empty. So I don't really care what this controller is doing. 
It could be calling a mediator, calling a database, calling a third party. It doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, so it is, uh, all I'm giving it is the endpoint and passing in a payload and then testing the results. So whatever it's doing, it is uh, running that whole thing for me. If anyone has a question they would like Matthew to answer but doesn't feel confident doing it in chat, whisper it to Surly Dev. Sure. And I'll ask it anonymously in chat for you. Absolutely fine. Uh, I'm okay with that. And Surly Dev has no reservations about um, asking me any sort of uh, question, which is totally fine, which is great. Uh, it's one of the reasons Surly Dev is a moderator because uh, while he does give me a lot of grief sometimes, it's good natured grief, of course, but he's also a very helpful, uh, very friendly guy. So thank you, Surly Dev, for offering to do that. I appreciate that. Um, and if you think of something later, if you're watching this on, on YouTube later, um, you can whisper to Surly Dev on Twitch if you want to. Um, but you can also email me uh, if you'd like, if you have a question you want to ask. Or, or leave it in the YouTube comments, of course. But let me just give you my email address here. Um, there you go. Matthew.Groves at Couchbase.com. Happy to answer any questions about this project or, or anything else that you're interested in in terms of comes to coding. Um, don't send me any spam. Don't try to sell me mailing lists or... Um, you know, whatever else, but uh, happy to answer any questions uh, about anything, really, uh, especially related to Couchbase. Obviously, that's part of my job, but anything uh, .NET or coding related, happy to, happy to do it. So anyway, that's how this test works here, and you can see that this is just expecting an unauthorized. Uh, what's the problem here? Consider using the constraint model is equal to? Hmm, interesting. So yeah, so this is using assert r equal. There's something I usually don't use. I use assert that. But this was actually generated by ChatGPT. So that's probably why I use something that I don't typically use. But uh, let's, let's just change this while I'm here. Uh, unauthorized is equal to, I'm not sure what the problem was with that uh, code. Oh, let's see, actual value should be a constant. Oh, yeah, yeah, this should be backwards. Yeah. So, uh, assert that response.status code. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but it just kind of makes more sense. We want the status code to be unauthorized. Yep. And this is just testing that the actual data being returned has both these messages in it. And you can see down here, I did another combination of email and blank password or blank email and password. So these are, you know, it's possible that I could get API requests that are malformed like this that don't really do anything that could be from a bot or could be from a typo, who knows. But those need to be handled and it looks like the same thing goes for this test down here. And then I've got one uh, for login with correct credentials should be success, and so I need to change this to OK. So this is now <coughs> uh, a login request that should actually work, which means I need a user in the database first. So you can see this helper is coming into play. It's being very helpful. I already wrote this, and so I can just reuse it, put a specific uh, email password. And here's another helper here. This is the login model helper. Again, following the same kind of pattern, but this creates a login submit model, which is the class that's being used here to submit payloads. Uh, and it has its own specific structure, so it has this nested user thing, which we know from day one in Conduit is kind of a weird design decision that they made, but that's just the way the spec goes, so that's what we're going to use. Uh, so there's the user controller. And so this test is just to make sure that, hey, the uh, Login successful login works, and this is where I actually have uh, an issue. So I know I was working on this my laptop. I just committed this to source control, so it's actually breaking the build right now. Um, but uh, so this test works. It's just that it's a little awkward to to do the assertions at the end because the end result of this is a uh, an object that contains this user property which contains the actual user view. So it's that nested user again. But I used a uh, anonymous object here. So how do I get that anonymous object out? Um, 
uh, you know, the JSON string will be there, of course. So the whole JSON will be there. So it, this will generate, this right here will generate all valid JSON. But then how do I get that back into C Sharp to do the assertions on it? So that's what I'm looking at right here. So um, one way to do it is I can certainly just uh, take the uh, response, JSON response, and deserialize it. And that's going to go into a dynamic object because I don't have a class, so I'm just going to use dynamic. And then I can, on that, I can say, well, the email, uh, let's see. So this is dynamic, right? So, and this is not email, it's going to be dot user dot email and dot user username. Notice the lowercase there because if you look back here, it's lowercase. And dynamic will respect those cases, it will not convert them to the normal uh, C sharp, you know, naming method. So I think this will make the test pass. And uh, I haven't actually tried this uh, locally or on this computer. So let me just make sure I have, uh, let's see, um, connect to Docker maybe? Is that what I'm using? Let's see, let's see if this couch base running right now. This computer has been rebooted because of the storms and power outages and things like that. So let's see. I haven't actually gotten Couchbase up and running yet. So I'm just going to run my local instance of Couchbase. And uh, this is just the one running directly on Windows. So I'm just turning the service back on. It's going to load up here in a second. Okay. Logging back in. I have some issues with this uh, running directly on Windows. I don't know what's going on with it. it. Seems a little bit slow, a little bit laggy. It's an older version. I mean, not, not that old of a version, but uh, yeah, I, I don't. This is going really slowly. So I don't know what's going on there. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop that one. And I probably should be using uh, Capella. That's what I should be doing. But uh, let's try Docker first. I think I have a container already in here. This is what I was using on my laptop because I didn't have inter internet access to use Capella. But if you've been watching the stream, you know I've had issues with uh, Docker as well. Although it seems to work way better on my laptop. Um, so I don't know what's going on here. This, you know, I haven't updated or paved this machine in a long time. And um, Windows 11's out there, kind of uh, something that I'm using on the laptop, but not using on this desktop yet. So it might be time for a whole system wipe. But uh, the time for that is not now. It's going I got to get through some, uh, some travel first. And then, uh, C, C sharp advent is starting up pretty soon. It's August. I know advent starts in December, but I got to be ready with, uh, some updates and bug fixes and, uh, setup so I can open the, the call for people to join C sharp advent I'm looking for 50 people. Again, if you're not heard of C sharp advent, CS advent Christmas. Yes, that's a real website, csadvent.christmas. And I run that every year, and you can see this is 2022's. So two people a day are posting C-sharp related content, and blog post, video, podcast, uh, you know, whatever it is, video, uh, I said video already, um, GitHub projects, whatever, whatever it may be, posting these to C-sharp advent. And so every day, like December 1st, these are the first two that are revealed. And the rest of them are kind of hidden, just like an advent calendar. And then day two, these are open and so on. So I need 50 different signups. Now, some people last year filled in, did a couple. Um, but generally speaking, I want to keep it to you know, one per person because that's a lot to ask, especially in December. Anyway, uh, this has got to get uh, up and running here soon. So might have time for re repaving my computer maybe in January. I don't know. We'll see. Anywho, where was I? Yeah, running this test. Um, did it did it pass? 
you know, test sessions. It did in fact pass. So the issue with this test is that is kind of the dynamic part there. Like that's fine. Um, but if this changes in the future, it, it could is going to possibly break this because there's no class being shared between them. But on the other hand, I don't want to just create a class only for the purpose of unit testing. Like, does it really add anything here to create a specific class? Like if this was, you know, foobar baz instead of just new, what does that gain me other than making my test a little easier? Um, man, it, there might be some argument for that, but I think I'm going to leave it that for now, especially because I want to get on to some features today. Um, and uh, these tests are passing, so I'm happy with them. Okay, so speaking of features, let's get on with it. Uh, right, that's the next thing? Yeah, so this git profile has been hanging out here in this update docs uh, column for a while because if we go to git profile uh, handler, uh, notice that this following is hard-coded to false because when I built this endpoint, I didn't have any sort of following um, data. So I just hard-coded it to false so I could go and create the follow and unfollow endpoints. I haven't done the unfollow yet, but I've done follow, which is enough to finish this endpoint and get this card over the finish line. So, with that being said, um, Basically, I just need to change this following here to look up the following. So we can say user data service dot is uh, is current user following. And so in order to look that up, I need the current user's username, uh, which I believe I have in request.username. I need the user I'm following. Um, uh, right. Uh, wait a second, let me think about this. No, they need the current user's username. Uh, with this, this profile is to get a profile of any user. Uh, so I need to get the Yes, the, the token. And uh, am I following the username? Okay. Now, notice that this token is optional. So, um, let's move this comment down here. If there's no token specified, there's no point in calling this is user following. Is, let's, let's just let's refactor a little bit. Is current user following? And we're going to go ahead and move this over here. I don't have that method yet. But I don't have to do this at all. I can say if, if uh, request.optional bear token, uh, if, if it's not null or empty, so if it's actually specified, then do that and I'm going to create just a stub method here, just a, a nothing. This is going to be a task of bool. Um, current user bearer token and user name. Okay. What does it like here? User data service is not is not null here. What? Best thing company declaration or labeled statements. What? <laughs> Invalid embedded statements? What are you talking about here? Oh. Because. Oh, wait. Oh, still doesn't like it. <clears throat> embedded statement cannot be declared or labeled statements. What the heck does that mean? Why can't I do that? Uh, 
I mean, I was probably going to do that anyway. Put this up here. Uh, make a false by default. Hmm. It's odd. Okay. But then I thought I could just refactor this. No. Hmm. Okay. I don't know what the error was there. I'm confused by that. But yeah, basically, if a token's not specified, then don't even bother. It's just you're not following them because you're not even logged in. Um, and uh, otherwise, let's go and check. <clears throat> so, got to go ahead and make that method. So the current user, uh, we need to find the current user's username, right? Current user username equals. And I think I can use auth service for this. Get a uh, username claim from the bearer token. So this is just parsing a token. This is not hitting a database. It's just parsing a token, getting the current username, f getting the username from the current user. Now I need to hit the database. I need to say, um, basically, um, so there's a, f uh, there's a different, hmm. So this probably belongs in the, is there another service for following? How did I do that? Did I put that in a different service? Let's see. I did. Yeah. So this probably doesn't make sense to go here. Yeah. Take this out of here. This needs to go in a different service, the follow service, which I need to add here. Right. Hey, pcrum73, thank you very much for the follow. What's going on, pcrum? How are you? Just working on the... Uh, conduit project today. Uh, I need to bring in follow data service and introduce read only field. So this needs to be follow data service. Is current user following? Okay. Yes. Okay. That makes more sense. Okay. So current user bearer token and username. Get that method. Okay. This is much better. Okay. Uh, this, does, this, this needs auth service, though. I auth service. So I can get the information from the bearer token. So current user, username equals auth service dot get username claim from the bearer token. Okay. So that is the current user. So now I need to look up that user's follow document. So current user follows equals, and uh, this is going to be the same collection up here. Oh, this needs to be async. I really wish ReSharper would add those for me. If it saw the task, it would just add async. Maybe there's a setting for that. Uh, anyway, um, current user follows, so the follow key, which is very similar to what I was doing up here. Follow key, but not follow username. Now I want the current user, not bear token, current user username, colon colon follows. And the set, same thing. And so all I need to do now is just return set contains, let me get async. Uh, username. Okay, so let's walk through this. So I have a bearer token, which is a big string of gobbledygook that encodes some data, including username. Uh, and so what this method does is if we go to auth service, this is going to go through that gobbledygook, that bearer token, parse it using this token handler, and return, in this case, just the username. There's multiple claims inside of a token, so a claim is just you can think of different bits of data that are in that token. Uh, there's other stuff in the token. Sometimes it's just a, a uh, arbitrarily random string, like a password. 
Uh, you can think of the token as that, but it has information embedded in it, which is kind of what makes JWT interesting. And so this method is going to say, okay, I know there's multiple claims. I just want the username claim. So claim type username, which I defined up here, right? Claim type username. There's multiple building claim types. I need to add a username one. And so it's going to get the username from the token. So whenever I'm making a request, it's like, give me the profile for Surly Dev. I'm Matt, here's my token. Give me Surly Dev's profile. Well, uh, that's easy enough. I can get, I can look that stuff up in the database, like his Surly Dev username, his bio, his image. But in order to get hit, whether or not I'm following him, I have to look that data up in another piece of data called the follow document or follows document. So this is, I now have my username, so M Groves, Matthew Groves, whatever. And I have Surly Dev's username. So this is, this will gets turned into Matt Groves here, and this is already Surly Dev. So we need to look up that follows document. And the follows document is always my username, colon, colon, follows. Okay, so this is going to look up a document that contains a list of everyone that I follow, an array of everyone that I follow. And one way I can deal with that in the couchbase.net SDK is I can put that into what's called a set, a couchbase set. And this is just going to treat that array as if it were an array of unique items because I can only follow a person once. There's no sense putting surly dev in there multiple times. Uh, it's just one surly dev is all that should be in there. So I'm turning this into a set, then I have some set operations and one of them is contains. Uh, does this set contain surly dev? If so, then yes, I am following surly dev. If not, false. I'm not following surly dev. And that is what's being returned here. Are, am I following surly dev or not? Now, what's the problem with this? Oh, XML comments. Yeah. Okay. So I think that works. Uh, but I don't have any tests for that. I probably should have written those first. Um, let's see. Just make this take off the to do here because that's what I'm doing. And this code I think can be refactored, but let's get a test working first, shall we? And I believe it is get profile handler test where I have some to do's. I'll, uh, wait, this is the integration test, right? Yeah, but look at that. There's already stuff failing because I need to put in new follow data service, which, uh, we we'll use the follows collection provider, collection provider, and all service. Okay, and so I need to add another collection here called follows. Can I just do that like this? Can I just chain it? Yes, I can. And we'll do this follows equals. I conduit follows collection provider. I'll make this one a nice private field, and there we go. So that test isn't broken anymore, but of course it's going to break my unit test somewhere, right? Yeah. So let's get the uh, these are the unit tests. No, this is also integration test. Okay. Um, auth service. That's the one problem with having to construct these test objects all manually is that it breaks a lot of tests when I add dependencies. So these, this is, uh, okay, this is the unit test I wanted to work on, so. But the, the alternative is I have to construct my own container, which I think is just as much of a pain in the butt. I just wanna have to do it as many times, I suppose. I don't know. I haven't found a really, uh, really uh, elegant way to do that that I like. So, new mock here. We're in unit test territory, so I'm just mocking things out. Hello. What's your problem here? Follow data service. There we go. Get it together. Visual Studio. Okay. So, uh, this down here be another mock. And maybe this handler should be refactored up to the constructor. I mean, probably. 
That makes sense. It's the same exact code, right? Yeah. So let's move this. Do some refactoring while I'm here. It's not arranged anymore, it's setup. Setup handler. Underscore handler. Mm -hmm. So then this needs to be changed to underscore and then get rid of this. Underscore handler here. So like clean up unit tests. I'm gonna write some more anyway, so uh, this definitely could use a helper as well. So uh, we can say if our user equals user helper, create user. And all I really need to care about is the username. So I can get rid of that. Boom, gone. So is this in compile? Can I start running these? Yes. So I'm not adding any tests here. I'm just refactoring tests. This is all the, this is called the Boy Scout rule, right? If you're familiar with the uh, Boy Scouts of America, one of the rules they have is when you leave a campsite, it should be cleaner than when you arrived. Uh, just kind of a nice guideline to reminder to clean up your campsite, but also if someone else left some trash from before or something happened, clean that up too. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm Boy Scout ruling myself, my own code base. Uh, so this is, there's no helper for that, I don't think yet, but that's okay. I need to go there just yet. So, uh, next thing I need to do is I need to test the following, um, the code that I just wrote. So I have two tests I need to write, test the user is following and test the user is not following. So these might be combined into one test with multiple cases, but let's, uh, let's run a test. So, um, profile for a user who isn't uh, followed. Okay. Um, should have false for followed. Makes sense. So we've done my range. Act. Assert. I should do like a little template for that or something, but the act is going to be very much the same. Whoops. And the assert is going to be basically that profile view dot following is equal to false. Okay. So I need a request equals new get profile request. And, um, okay, so in order to do that, I need, this might be where I need a helper, actually. Because um, I'm going to put a lot of setup in here, but we can get to that. All right. So I'm just going to do this, the scenario that I suggested. So um, I'm going to get a uh, surly dev as the username and current user token. And our current user token equals, I'm going to get that from the auth service dot generate token. Um, this is for me as a current user. So it's going to be matt.groves at example.net and username of Matt Groves. Okay. So I don't need to actually have Matt Groves in the database. I do need to have Matt Groves is following information in the database for this test to work. So I also need to arrange to put that in there. So follow source data mock dot create following. And uh, this is a helper I'm going to create. But I just need the one, yeah, I'll put someone else in there too. Who, who was that to just follow? We're going to put P crumb in there as well. P crumb 73. You are now in my test data, P crumb. You can't do anything about it. <laughs> okay, so I need this. Uh, helper here to actually put that following document in the database. Although, wait a second, no. These are unit tests, these are unit tests. I don't need to do that yet. I need to mock. I'm getting ahead of myself, okay. I need to mock uh, the follow data service dot setup. The mock to is current user following, uh, current user token and Am I following surly dev is the question. And the answer to that will be uh, false. I'm not following surly dev in this test. F 
for a user to not be followed. So there's the request, act, and I think that's all I need. Good morning, Napalm Codes, how are you? Welcome. You just missed out on a chance to be in test data. Did that, that looks like it failed. Let me just try this again. Uh, the old null reference exception, okay. Get profile by username, okay, because I didn't mock out that. <laughs> uh, let's see, get profile by username. So, yes, it still needs to get Surly Dev's profile, so that needs to be mocked out as well. M dot get profile by username. Surly Dev returns a sync new. What is it I'm supposed to return? Um, profile results. Data, so data service results, new data service results. Of, is it user? Oh, yeah, user. Okay, user. So what's new, Napalm Codes? How are you? Uh, I can't remember data service user, how I, how I set that up. It's all constructor based, okay. So this is going to be uh, the uh, user and data result is okay. Range for user to not be followed. So I need a user equals user helper dot create user and username is surly dev. And at this point I can whoops I can actually stop hard coding that. Okay, all right, so I'm creating a user in memory, right? Creates a user object, does not write the database, so I left myself a helpful comment there. I'm setting up the follow service to mock the fact that I'm not following Surly, and setting up the user data service to return a Surly Dev's profile. Again, I'm not actually in the database, because it needs that, otherwise it, uh, it bombs out here. Nothing new or exciting me? Well, I just got back from uh, that conference Got some Happy Camper coffee. And I'm going to turn around tomorrow and begin a tour of Michigan. Some Michigan user groups from Detroit up to Lansing and uh, I think back to Detroit again and then to Grand Rapids to finish out the week. So I'll be on the road starting tomorrow sometime afternoonish maybe I'm not sure I got to figure out I got to do the math how long it takes me I got to pick up the rental car how long it takes me to get up to Detroit and so on so I'll be in Detroit tomorrow if anybody here is in Detroit come see me I'll be uh, at uh, the Java user group on Wednesday and I'll be at the what's called the mi.net user group on Friday and um, I think I tweeted about those but uh, if you're in those areas I can give you more information I'll be in Lansing on Thursday and then Beer City Code, a conference in Grand Rapids on Friday night. I'm getting there late probably. And then Saturday, I'll be there all day. Friday night will be a late because I'm presenting to a user group on Friday night, which is a new one for me. I've never done a Friday night user group presentation. I, I am looking forward to it. Um, but uh, if I'm just saying if it was me, I, I don't think, I think it would be a hard time for me to go to a Friday night user group. I would probably... Um, be, uh, be wanting to do something else on Friday night, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe there's some really hardcore, uh, awesome devs in uh, Detroit who want to go to a user group on Friday night, get some pizza, and uh, hang out with their uh, colleagues. But we'll see. We'll see. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So this is mocked out now, so that's good. Getting the result. JWT is specified, right? Uh, yep, right there. Okay, so now we should pass. Of course, then I get back from Michigan on Saturday, late Saturday. Next week, not quite as long of a trip, but I'll be in Indianapolis for Indie Code Conference. It's a two-day conference in Indianapolis. 
Uh, I'll be presenting on the second day. The first day is workshops, I believe. So I'll be there. And then when I get back from that, the week after that, I believe is when I start my jury duty. So I don't know how it works for you all. Uh, if you have jury duty, where you're, where you're from, or if you're in the United States, different states do it differently. But I'm on call for two weeks. So I have to be ready to go in to the courthouse or whatever. Uh, and they're going to let me know every morning if I should come in or not. And I'm on call like that for two weeks. So potentially like uh, 12 days in, they can say, hey, come on in. And then I'm on a jury for however long the case is. So I actually am looking forward to it. I've never been on jury duty before. Uh, my wife has been. My sister has been. Lots of people I know have been. And I've always been jealous of them because I, I just thought it would be interesting to serve on a jury. And now's my chance finally. So... Of course, my luck, I won't get called in during those two weeks. But I need to be ready to go in those two weeks, so I can't go anywhere. But I will be. Every time you get selected, it gets canceled. Well, yeah, I wonder what that's about. I, I guess it's probably because there are a lot of cases that get settled or, you know, they change to a guilty plea or whatever, and uh, just kind of don't need a jury for that, right? But Which is fine, because uh, having a jury is... Having a jury trial is time-consuming, expensive, and, uh, you know, for the defendant, you don't know, like, what's going to happen. So, I, I'm pretty sure this is not civil cases, but I'm, I'm not sure. I really have no idea. So, I'm just looking forward to learning more about the process. So, hey, our test passes. Great. Uh, and now, I need to, you know what, I could probably make this a test case, right? Uh, we'll call this one false. Is uh, user following? And let's set this to uh, right here. And that's right there. So really, I'm just testing this kind of mock that I'm putting in there. But uh, you know, there's not much being tested in this in this unit test. But it, it gives us a starting point anyway to test kind of the logic in the handler. So those are all working just fine. Good, good, good. Uh, and so this is done. Profile for a user. Uh, need to change the name of this. Profile for a user following the user in the profile. Okay. Bada bing, bada boom, as Calvin would say. So there's a unit test, and the code is done. Now let's just think about this data access here real quick. Like, is this the optimal access? And I think it is. All I'm doing is two things. I'm checking the token, which is very quick, no data access involved there. It's just JWT parsing. And then I'm doing one lookup of one document uh, in Couchbase. Uh, and looking in that, see if there is a, 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 a certain string in that, in that set. That's, that, it, that might actually be in multiple operations there, because this is kind of encapsulating the details of how it works. But I'm going to just take for granted that this set is going to be the optimal set of, of operations behind the scenes. And I, if you remember a couple weeks back, I actually put together some benchmarks to compare the different options in Couchbase for managing this. So I compared a set, which is what I'm using, versus a list, which is like a set, except there's no constraint on any uniqueness there, and then a raw array, just handling it myself. Uh, and there's, there's strengths and weaknesses to each of these approaches, right? Um, and if you, this is all committed, so if you want to see all these benchmarks, you can, but uh, the eventual conclusion, if I can show it here, um, maybe, where is it? Is it here? Yeah. Yeah, so here's the conclusion that I came to. These are the benchmarks that I ran. And we look at this and you say, well, gosh, Matt, you need to, you know, all the fines are about equal. So I think I'm pretty confident there that the set that I'm doing, the set lookup is pretty fast you know, within some standard deviation, they're about equal, right? Um, 
the actual the the operation here add to set is the one that took the longest 26,000 microseconds uh, to actually add an item to the set with a you know pretty wide uh, margin of error there actually I only only ran 50 times I think but and so the add to list was much faster of course you know, I lose the constraints there so add to array optimistic locking is pretty fast uh, that has an optimistic constraint on it which I covered all these before and then add to array pessimistic is probably is what I assume the add to set is doing behind the scenes but it must not be the case I must have missed something there because it's it's not as uh, as slow as add to set however with all this information in mind the the find is what's going to happen the most often and so all of those are roughly equal. So I may as well use the set there because I get the benefit of unique constraints. Uh, the add to set is 26,000 microseconds, which is the longest, yes. But that's not very much time. That's 260 milliseconds, right? That's less than, a, that's less than half a second uh, to do that. And it doesn't happen very often. How often do you follow someone on Twitter or Medium. Not as often as you get their profile and determine whether or not they're being followed. So I think that's okay. Uh, of course, my comment here was add to array optimistic, but uh, list might work too. And I uh, contradict myself letter, later because set is more ideal. But uh, I did this research ahead of time, so I can, I can change it if we need to because all that stuff is in this user data service. So this is one of the benefits of having your data access separate from your handler, from your logic, is that you know people say, oh, you can change your database easier. Okay, how often does that happen? But you can change your data access methods easier. So in this case, I am just doing a simple you know, look up here and using the set. If I want to, I could put the more complex array logic in here if it makes sense to for performance reasons. I could change that here. And this is, you know, one of the things if you're in the relational world, uh, hey, it's that onion. Thank you for the follow of that onion. Are you from that conference, that onion? We were just talking about that conference. Oh, I've got to sneeze. Hit the mute button just in time. So with a relational database, this is also, also applies, right? You can change your SQL queries, your whatever you want in here. But I think it's even more applicable with Couchbase because there are multiple options for interacting with data. So it's key value lookup, which is the fastest way. Within that, there's these um, data structures like set and list. That onion, first time chat, thank you for joining that onion. What, what brings you here today? And what's, uh, explain that interesting uh, um, emote there, Kon, Koncha, some sort of anime character, I'm, I'm guessing, or manga character. Uh, so I can use those. I can use a SQL query if I want to for Couchbase here. I can use full text search. Probably doesn't make sense in this case, but it could. Uh, lots of options. And so with this, with this uh, separate data service, I can refactor this without having to touch my handler at all. So the handler here is going to assume that whatever this method is doing, it's going to be the optimal method. I don't care how it works as long as it does work. So this is an important part of constructing your application, especially with Couchbase, is keep that data access as encapsulated as possible. So if you need to change it for performance reasons or whatever, you can. Looking for a cool new stream to follow? Well, I don't know about cool. Uh, I'll let uh, others decide if I'm cool enough, but we are doing some coding in the stream. If you like coding, uh, this is the place to be, especially if you're into .NET, C Sharp, NoSQL, backend database stuff, all about it. But we can discuss anything here. People drop in, ask for career advice or opinions on languages and frameworks, happy to talk about those as well. So we're very beginner, very beginner friendly channel. You can ask any question you want to. Uh, the, the rule is, the only stupid question is the one you do not ask. And uh, Surly Dev has a corollary to that, is it's easier to fix 
a stupid question than it is to fix uh, a stupid action you took by not asking the question. Something like that. <laughs> uh, always ask questions. Dumb questions are easier to fix than making dumb mistakes. There we go. So backends are cool. I'm glad you feel that way, that onion, because I'm very much a backend developer. I'm not a front end developer. <laughs> Napalm codes. What's it like working for Couch? I assume you mean Couch Base. Any good .NET opportunities there? So, Couchbase itself, Couchbase server, Couchbase uh, sync gateway, those main products, do not, they're not written with any .NET as far as I know. They're written with C, Erlang, Go, some Java. However, we do have a .NET SDK, of course, which I'm using today. And we have, uh, if you're into mobile, we have a Couchbase Lite SDK for .NET. And there are some uh, associated .NET um, projects like a dependency injection and caching, all for distributed caching, all that work in .NET. So there is some .NET work here. However, you know, in terms of being hired as a .NET engineer, there's not a lot. Um, as far as I know, there's maybe four like dedicated .NET engineers in all of Couchbase. Now I am writing .NET, but I'm not part of the engineering team. I'm actually part of the <coughs> marketing, <coughs> marketing, um, nothing, uh, marketing team. Uh, so I'm writing code um, because uh, I'm, I'm just writing an example to help other people uh, work with Couchbase. Well, it's a bummer unless you're really into those languages I mentioned, like uh, Go and, uh, oh, there's some Rust as well, uh, some Rust stuff. Uh, if you're into Go, Erlang, C, uh, even some Java, there's some, lots of great opportunities for engineering here at Couchbase. And, of course, there's front-end stuff. There's JavaScript, and uh, um, I'm not sure Capella, uh, our cloud-based offering. Uh, I think it's using all the same languages Probably mostly written in Go, if I had to guess. But of course, JavaScript. Um, so yeah, I you know I've been here seven years. I'm I consider myself a .NET developer, but uh, I'm not uh, I'm not part of the core engineering team. So you may be into those things, but not sure you could be hired for the expertise in one. Yeah, that's that that's tough, right? Because it's the thing is, it's a database company. Databases are like uh, they're they're difficult. They're difficult to engineer a database. It really is. Especially a distributed, uh, you know, um, clustered database like Couchbase. So, um, but yeah, um, yeah, that's just the way it is. Okay, so uh, I think I covered everything there. The set list array, yep, and so our, the, the test works. Uh, the unit test works. So now I want to create some integration tests. I think it's probably next, but I'm going to take a quick message, maybe refresh my coffee. We'll be back in less than a minute. All right, I'm back. I told you it'd be quick. Okay, ow, just banged my knee on my desk. <sighs> All right, so integration tests is next. Uh, this is the Git Profile Handler test. So currently, this, this test should still work, but it's always hard-coded to following equals to false. And uh, create user in database. So I, I think I do want to create a, a separate test here. Because this, this is an important feature, I think. Get user when following another user. So all I care about now is the following. Don't really care about these too much. So arrange user already in database, and I want to arrange uh, 
database uh, uh, range them following another user. So I need two users in the database. So follower, following, and I'm going to do a wait follows, creates, I don't have that yet, but creates a follow from the user in database following dot username, user in database follower dot username. So uh, this is going to be extension method on where do I put those at? Let's see. Yes, follow helper. Yes, okay. So it's gonna be right here. I uh, call it create follow. So extension method is of course a static method. Um, and uh, it has to have a this, I'll do I conduit follows. I always name them at this, they can call us whatever you want to, but that's just what I do. And we'll say, was it follower, following and follower, following user, follower user. What doesn't it like here? What's the problem? Is this a static method? Oh, it needs, needs the return task. Yep, obviously, okay. So then I'm just going to go ahead and do something very similar to what I was doing up here. Follower user. Maybe I'll change that to match the, uh, the naming up there. Following. Okay, so there I've got Okay, in this case, so up here, I'm trying to see if the document exists. If it doesn't, that's actually, uh, you know, this is an assertion, so I don't want to create that. But in this case, I want to create it, right? So if it doesn't exist, then we're going to go ahead and create it. Uh, await, follow collection, uh, dot create, no, no. Touch? Uh, no, not touch. That's different. Uh, what I want to do is just probably insert. Although, what probably would be easier is if I just skip that stuff and just say upsert. So upsert will either update it or create it. Although, let me see here. So I want to use set. All right. Going back and forth on this a lot. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, how do I how do I do a new set? Let's see. Get profile handle. Let's see. Where was I? So this is I don't I have a hard time remembering syntax like this because I don't use it all the time. Collection dot set. Follow collection dot set. It's just going to be string and the follow doc ID. Okay. Now, I think this will create the document if it doesn't exist. All right. And then I can just say set dot add username following following. Okay. Uh, so that's going to create a follows document if it doesn't exist and add this user to it. Okay, all right. So this is going to be equal to true then. Uh, the bearer token should be something. So uh, auth service, just do new auth service, right? I don't have auth service up here. I do now. No sense in doing it up if I already have one. All service, all service dot generate token. I don't actually have. I'm gonna move these up here. OK, 
Okay, generate token, and this is the user doing the follow wing. So, user in user in database follow wing email. This doesn't really matter. And user in database following dot username. Okay, and the bearer token will be in here. Okay, does that all make sense? This username. What is this for? I don't need that. Yeah, I don't need to specify a username. Take that part out. It's being done automatically. Uh, so I'm getting the profile request for the user in database follow wing dot username. And yeah, okay, let's try it. Uh, another thing, Napalm Coves, I, I, I should mention this. So I, I'm talking about just the engineering portion of Couchbase, but there are other places you can uh, you can apply your coding. So if you want to do like solutions engineering, for instance, or professional services, certainly .NET will be valuable there. Uh, in fact, having a broad experience with uh, languages and frameworks will be helpful. So those are called SEs or solution engineers. Um, or, or uh, there's other teams like professional services, which is more like uh, consulting. So uh, let's say there's a Couchbase customer that says, hey, we need help building something and we're using Couchbase. We can actually, they can actually hire professional services to come out and spend two weeks doing architectural review or helping build something or debug something or whatever. Uh, so that's another, another places where coding is definitely a, a useful skill. Um, the SEs, though, tend to be based in regions, right? So if you're an SE in, like, the East, for instance, you might need to be based in a New York area or Boston or something like that. Um, might need to be based near one of those major cities, one of those major areas to cover. Professional services, I'm not sure about that. Um, those guys are always so, so busy. I never really uh, have time to talk to them about stuff like that. Um, but they do a lot of traveling. Uh, so they might fly out to a customer and, and be on site for two weeks to work through an issue. So uh, those are more general purpose. Those aren't really like you're not building a part of Couchbase. You're helping customers or future customers build stuff or do proof of concepts or that sort of thing. Uh, okay. Oh, I've never been registered. Did I not put that in? In the, uh, let's see here. Let me never been registered. It's possible I didn't register it. Unrelated, I was trying to start a new Blazor Wasm project last night, but the .NET 8 preview bits aren't all there yet. I have not touched .NET 8 yet. Uh, I am, this is .NET 7 you're seeing on the screen here. I generally kind of stay away from the preview uh, unless I have a really good reason to, because that's sort of thing's going to happen. I'm going to end up spinning my wheels and, uh, um, you know, not get something done. Uh, and I already have enough trouble with that. So let's see. Yeah, it's right here. I follows collection provider. I could probably reduce that. No, I can't reduce it. What is the problem here? This is not registered. I conduit follows collection provider has has not been registered. Oh, wait, no, yeah. Oh, gosh, put the wrong thing there. All right, here we go. Usually don't touch preview, but Greenfield everyone says you start on eight now. Who, who's everyone? Right, <laughs> I am. Um, confident that there are people starting greenfield projects plenty of them who are starting it on versions as old as like five and six uh, so yeah i don't know who everyone is but maybe you can challenge that and i would also say that going from dotnet a major dotnet version to another dotnet version is not as big a deal as it used to be right like going asp.net 2 to asp.net 4 was complicated but uh, going from .NET 7 to 8, I don't imagine it being very difficult to do. 
the weird thing there, and this is typical with Microsoft stuff, okay, trying to get a project to do two things like host the WASM with ASP.NET Core backend that has some APIs in it. Simple stuff, but I think the Blazor unified things may have changed the model some. Oh, okay. Maybe there's a big difference in, in eight. I haven't, I really want to, but I have not done much with Blazor. It's, I don't do much with front end period, but uh, when I do, it's just really a quick JavaScript thing, basically. So I don't generally get much into Blazor. I, uh, if I ever do have to go into UI, that's that's what I'd like to use is, is C Sharp, of course. But uh, anyway, we've got an error here. Uh, so it's true, but was false. Hmm. <laughs> let's uh, let's step through a little bit here. Let's see what's going on. And I might have to peek into the database to see what's happening. I'm guessing I got something backwards. Okay. Creating users and follower. Well, that seemed to be very fast. Uh, let's have a look. What's in there? Okay, so I've got these users, and I've got two, should have two users, I only have one user, uh-oh, I only have one user. What, oh, that's, oh, that's in the wrong collection. What the heck? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, there's two users. I must have been in the wrong... Okay, whatever. Two users, so SIA and A5E. This is A5E is following SIA, so that makes sense. Uh -huh. So follower is A5E. Oh, see, that might be backwards. And SIA is... Following. SIA is following. Wait. Oh. I hate these names. I hate them. Okay, let's try this again. User in database doing the following. User in database being followed. Oh, okay. So it creates. Following and a follower. Doing the following. Okay, okay, all right, all right, okay. Did these go away? Oh, shoot, I didn't mean to stop it. Yeah, that's okay. The, the test should take care of it. All right, try this again. Naming things, am I right? Always the big problem. Let's get myself turned around with all this following follower stuff. Okay. All right. So here are the users. I could probably name them better too in the whatever. So ROIZ and DMS. Uh, ROIZ is following DM DMS. So doing the following is R RYZ. What? RYZ. Okay. RYZ and being followed is DMS. Okay, great. Generate the token. It's a bunch of gobbledygook. You can see this is what a token looks like, uh, in case you're wondering. It's a bunch of information, some random information, and then there's encoded information in there, email address, and username. Whoops, I just hit print screen by accident. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, user, get profile of user being followed. That is DMS. Okay, and the request. Okay, that's request, okay. And then get the profile. So there's the results, profile view. It says following false. Okay. So let's step through this guy, I guess. Oh, something wrong in the handler?
Okay, here, I'm going to do something else here, just to make this easier for me to follow along. Okay, I'm going to call this username doing the following. This one username the follower. And I'm going to put a little string on there just because I don't want it to cause any duplications if I mess up some point. So here we go. That should hopefully clarify things a little bit. Okay, so now I'm in the handler. As I go back to my database, here's the, f doing the following, and there's the follower. Doing the following, wait. I call it the follower. I should call it the followed. Terrible. The followed. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, and refresh here. So, doing the following, the followed. Okay, that makes sense. So we're gonna get profile by username. Let's just go into that. Okay, so that's probably fine. This is getting uh, followed, right? Username's not in there, okay. That's okay, because it's the followed. So now this is where it's checking. Is the current user following? So token and username, the followed. Am I following the followed? <laughs> okay. Here we go. Current username equals the followed. Oh. Yeah, that's the problem. Why am I getting, where is this prof uh, profile handler? It's passing in the wrong token, I think. User, okay, yeah, okay. This should be user doing the following. Uh, all right, now it should pass. Gosh, that's confusing. Ah, still not working, huh? Now what's the problem? <laughs> okay, so current username equals doing the following. Yep, okay. I'm going to get the follow current user username equals doing the following, and that's what's out there, right? Doing the following. Yep, uh, UJU. Yes, okay. And there's anything in there? Yeah, there's one item in there, okay. All right, so there's the set. The followed, that should be in there. The followed TTJ, right? Yeah. Oh, where was this? This was profile handler. Why didn't it hit that breakpoint? Let's try this again. It seems to be working. Something is wrong here. With that area, I think. Okay. 
Why is it returning false? Is this not the correct thing? Set dot contain has got to be the right one, right? Okay, let's try it again with this new breakpoint here. Is current user following? I didn't hit the breakpoint. Oh, okay. There we go. All right. Results false. It doesn't make any sense. Zero K O. Whoa, what the heck is that? Oh. That's weird. Okay. All right. That's what's going on here. So this isn't the username. This needs to be value. <laughs> oh, boy. Hey, salty fire buff. Those are some great adjectives. Salty fire buff. All right. What's going on? Salty fire buff. Glad you're here. Okay. Now the test should pass. See, this test actually caught a bug. So there we go. Before I even tried running it. Perfect. Okay. And then we'll do another test. I don't think I can reuse that when not fall when not following another user. So this should be false. And so I won't have this in here. Let me just comment it out. So hopefully that won't cause a problem. And so in this case, following will be false. Because I'm not following that user. Got to go, but I will be back. I'm starting to learn coding again after having a master's degree in IT. That is old. You have an old master's degree? <laughs> hey, Salty Fire. Master's degree is a master's degree. So well done on that. But uh, yeah, I hope you'll come back and join. Definitely going through some coding here. Did that did that pass? What's up with that question mark? Let's try this again. I wasn't paying attention. I was reading Salty Fire Buff's message. Got to explain your name next time you come back, Salty Fire Buff. But I appreciate the follow. Thanks for stopping by. All right, so that's passing. Very good. Um, arrange the users are in your database but they aren't following anyone. Okay. Look at all these tests. So at that point, I think the this feature is done. Let's commit. I got tests. Uh, you know what? I'm going to run all the tests um, just before I commit. Just make sure I don't break anything else. So these tests will take a little bit of time because they're integration tests. A lot of them there. 18 integration, 53 units. Yeah, that seems about the right uh, ratio of integration to unit. You don't want to do too crazy with the integration tests because they are slow. And you don't want to do too crazy with unit tests because then they start to get useless. So, oh no. Already got a fail. Ah, I broke something. What did I break? What did I break? The rest of these run here. Make sure it's the only thing that's broken. See, if I didn't run this, I would get an email from GitHub in a few minutes like, hey, your build's broken. Oh, no. Build's currently broken, by the way, because I checked in some code that doesn't even compile. But I wanted to get it off my laptop onto this computer. So just use GitHub as kind of like Dropbox. What is this app anyway? Maybe it should have started there. Oh, so I mean, I've talked about this a long time. Um, 
in many other episodes, but happy to bring it up while these tests are running. So this is called Conduit. It is a part of the real world example app project. And you say, well, what's that? What's the real world project? Well, the real world project is a spec, basically. It's a clone of Medium, medium.com. It's called Conduit. Uh, so Medium is a social blog site. But the idea with this is there's a real world spec. Um, I'm just building a back end. There's front end specs as well. But uh, it has all these endpoints. So if I'm going to build a medium clone, a conduit clone, I have to follow these specs. Now, what's the point of this? Well, the point of this is that lots of people, um, if I can find the link here, lots of people can build, um, where is it? Conduit real world. Let's see. Uh, lots of people can, well, I'll just go to the go, go thingster. There should be one. Yeah, here we go. Lots of people, oh, gosh, get together. <laughs> GitHub, okay. Lots of people can build this application to the same spec using whatever language, backend, database, frameworks that they want. And what you end up with is right here, a huge repository of different examples of the same application being written in different languages and tools. So this is the newest one, actually, uh, the Express, Ottoman, and Couchbase example. So it's the same spec that I'm building, but it's written with Express, which is a Node framework, Ottoman JS, and Couchbase. So Ottoman is a, a Couchbase ODM framework, and Couchbase, of course, is the database. And so if I wanted to learn Express, for instance, I could go look at this example. And this is a real world example, right? A lot of times a to-do list is out there as an example, or there's like a one-off demo tutorial. This is a full set of APIs that can make a, I'm not gonna say it's as good as Medium, right? Because they probably have a lot more functionality built into it, but it's similar to Medium, uh, a Medium website. So lots of stuff involved in there, which is all the CRUD operations, but also like paging and following and uh, um, you know different modeling decisions have to go into it. And so that, that's what I'm doing. I'm building the ASP.NET plus Couchbase backend example. Okay, but right now I'm, I have a test that's failing. So a bucket is not present. So what's going on there? What do you mean bucket is not present? Right, privileges or bucket is hibernated. Hmm. So certainly Dev said he would have called it double XL, two XL, instead of medium, because that's the shirt size that I wear, right? This is a two XL right here. Da -dum -tsh. Rim shot. Okay, so bucket is not present. What did I do wrong here? This is the test I was working on earlier that, that passed earlier. So what did I break? Create user and database. Why would that? Oh, okay, because that is this test. Create user and database. User collection not instantiated or something? Did I forget to add something? User collection provider. No, that's a, yeah, what in the world? <laughs> this isn't using the following or anything, right? This is just, all these other tests are passing. <laughs> but they're not using create user and database though, are they? There's something wrong with create user and database? Provider default users. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what the problem is there. So that's something I need to fix. I do not need to hard code that string. But uh, we'll save that for another time. I might just refactor that on like a weekend or something. 
because I've done enough with the user secrets and environmental and server, server error. What? How did this test pass before? What in the world is internal server error? Create user and database. And then content of the payload. Hmm. Log in. Where's the where's my login? Right here, right? So it's returning. It should not be returning internal server error. That's not one of the options. So something's broken. Login request handler. Yeah, so I should probably come up with a really short way of discussing what conduit is uh, so I can remind people uh, when they're like, hey, what are you working on? So any suggestions for how to more quickly convey that than going into the whole, oh, condo, real world, open source, all this stuff. Okay, so is the result valid? Yep, all right. Get user by email. Is that user in there? F4U? Uh, what? Oh, that's the email address. Email is... Oh yeah, F4U is the key right there. F4U, yep, yep. So that should exist. Wait, that's not... No, okay. TMN at example.net. Yeah, so that's right. Okay, it looks like it bombed out there with that SQL query. Why is that? Hmm. I suspect there's an indexing issue. Is this maybe because I screwed something up with... No, no, that can't be it. There's nothing in there. Oh, oh, I bet I know. Let's see. I bet I know what it is. So it can use my email. I bet this is... I bet this is an issue in here. Yeah. I'll bet you. It's using the wrong bucket name or something. Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Next. Oh, I didn't even get that far. Huh? Geezer by email. Should have hit that breakpoint. What is going on? I'm almost sure this is a config issue, but it doesn't explain why the other tests... No, the other tests don't actually hit the database. So this has got to be a config issue. Got to be. Okay. That's where it bombs out, right there? Hmm... Why is that bombing out? Yeah, once everything's gone. All right, let's try this again. I'm gonna look at the database this time. See what's in there. Why is this unhappy about it? Because when I run these tests, they 
clean up the database at the end. So, all right, so this seems to think, yeah, users and default, that makes sense. So there's users and there's default. Uh, there's a user. What is the, hmm. So when this runs, it fails. Why is that? Wish I could see the bucket name from this. Oh, okay, yeah, there it is. So it can't can see the bucket name. If you notice here, yeah, you can't. Can I zoom in? Hard to see, but it's saying the bucket name is conduit. The bucket name is not conduit. It's conduit integration tests. So it's trying to pull from a bucket that's not there. But the question is, why is it trying to pull that? I think the reason is Right. Because, okay. So I got two things going on here. I'm, tell, I'm specifying the bucket name here, but the controller or the MVC project is getting its own configuration. Okay, I have a to do here already to do this. And I'm going to use ChatGPT for this. So, or not Chat, Google. So I did this before, uh, uh, GitHub Copilot chat. I did this before. And so um, for getting a, just pin this, for getting a web application factory, I use this code. But I want to use user secrets and environment variables with it. How do I? specify that. So let's just read this out here while it's responding. For getting a web application factory, I use this code, but I want to use user secrets and environment variables with it. How do I specify that? All right, so right now this is just spinning up that ASP.NET program as is. I'm not passing anything into it. Uh, so what is this saying here to do? Web, okay, I know there was, there was a, asked this before and there's a different way to do it. Let me just see if I can uh, figure this out. Um, can, so configure web, so this is a custom factory. Uh, is, there, is there a way to do it, which is fine. Is there a way to do it without a custom factory class? Can I specify it when instantiating web application factory instead. I think I asked chat GPT about this actually, not GitHub Copilot, so let's see. Use your secret environment, instantiating web, you register your secrets environment variables in program CS file as shown. The problem is I want to specify different user secrets. I want to specify user secrets from this app, from this project. Is there a extension on this? Configure. Create host builder. Host dot, that's not, I'm instantiating it though. Configure, there's no configure app configuration on that. Create default builder with web host builder. Maybe like this. Config dot use, wait, what is this? Uh, config dot add and no, there's no, there's nothing like that there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna go ask ChatGPT <laughs> because uh, it gave me a different answer last time. I wanna see if that is the correct answer. 
Oh, I gotta use, okay. I've already got that up in a browser over here. So uh, here is a n unit setup method below. Uh, how can I configure web, what's it called? Web application factory. Application factory to use user secrets and environment variables. There's the code. Let's see what it comes up with. Here's how you do it. Well, what is this? What is all this stuff? But I think this is the on the right track here. Okay. So with, whoa. So I'll pin you back over here. With web host builder. Okay. I don't know what that stuff is there. Builder.configure application config builder. Factory create client. That's not what it's doing. No, no, no. So this is just got caught up in my copy pasting. Okay. Okay, inside of that, I've got all this stuff. Add environment variables. Where's user secrets though? Okay, uh, like that, okay. Oh, there's, okay, your secrets, there we go, okay. And I wanna add for, I don't know, Caltrace integration test? Seems like a good, as good as one as the other. I don't, do I need this end for here? I don't think I do. Okay, so I think this might do it. It's going to pull from integration test user secrets, which are the conduit integration test bucket. And it's going to pass those into the web application. And this environment variables is because that's what I'm going to use on GitHub, GitHub workflows. So let's see if that works. This is should success. Should return success. How's that? Okay. What was this the one that was failing? Yeah. All right. So I think this will do it. It'll pass the connect, the correct names, everything. Fingers crossed. Ah, oh, darn it. All right. Let me just check user secrets here real quick. Doing that off screen. Yeah, conduit integration tests. That is correct. Glad I took this off screen because there is sensitive information in there. Uh, users and follows. Okay. So, what is the problem? Is this not doing what I expect it to right here? Because when I start up, oh, let me see. Oh, okay. So maybe this is because uh, uh, ah, this is being overridden, maybe. I'm specifying here, but then it's going in. in being overridden by this, right? It's taking in app settings, which is, oh, it's still there. I wonder which one it's pulling from. <laughs> Oof. Well, I didn't anticipate this. 
kind of fighting for which configuration to use. Hmm, so what does, is there any options here like don't override or something? Optional. Reload on change. No, nothing like that. But I want to leave user secrets in there because that's where this application is running. But let me just test my hypothesis here. If I comment this out, then it should then it should pass. That's my hypothesis. Is it that it's overriding the user secrets with the other user secrets? Nope, apparently not. Oh boy. This is a knowing one. Is it it's maybe it's doing it from app settings then? I don't know. Well, crumbs. Use your secrets there. Use your secrets here. I want these to be used. Configure app. Hmm. Hmm. This is where having like see I don't even know that's the issue. Like let's just comment all these out. And let's see if this see if this works. I reject your reality and I substitute my own. Is what I'm doing here. No, it didn't do anything. So what's going on here? Wait, what? Yeah, internal server error. So login controller for back to day service debug. Is it still pulling the word conduit from somewhere else? You get a bigger screen. Just move my chair slightly. Or maybe I can hang this thing from my shelf instead of attaching it to my chair. Maybe I'll try that. Okay, user collection provider. It's still getting conduit from somewhere. But where? Let me just double check those user secrets again. Uh... Cowspace integration tests. Yep, yep, yep. Conduit integration tests. Okay. Is there anywhere else where the word conduit is being used? Yeah, in the app settings. But I whacked those from being used. Wait, maybe I need to rebuild? It's not using any of those now. All right, maybe I just need to rebuild. Let's try this again. You know, I thought of one other place it might be, actually. Yeah. Because if I remember correctly, I've got something hacky. Super hacky. And this integration test right here. No, no, I removed that. I removed that hackiness. So this is going to pull... 
from the config. User secrets, yes. Oh no, hackiness is gone. <laughs> yeah, it was my last hope. Like, oh, let's go in and fix this hackiness. So this is getting user secrets, environment variables, which are not, those are set. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh. yep, 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 uh -huh. yep, yep, yep. Migrations, yeah, uh-huh. So that, that seems fine. Oops, I don't want to get rid of that just yet. So up here, I've been looking into these base platforms recently. You might have tipped the scales in favor of trying Couchbase. Really? Well, that's good to hear. Uh, which other platforms have you been looking at? And, and what is it about Couchbase that uh, in my, in my uh, struggle here to get it to work, get my test to work anyway, uh, what is it that uh, makes, makes uh, Couchbase appealing to you? By the way, the easiest way to try Couchbase is something called Couchbase Capella. That's the cloud-based version of Couchbase. You can sign up for a free trial, no credit card needed for that. Just going into my marketing mode here for a second. Couchbase Capella. There's also a Discord if you want to learn more about uh, Couchbase. There's a Couchbase Discord you can join. But here's the Couchbase Capella DBAS. This is the cloud-based offering if you want you know, Couchbase to manage the infrastructure and stuff for you. You can do that. You can also download a Couchbase server through Docker and whatnot. But uh, if you're interested in Couchbase Discord, you can join, uh, I think we've reached a thousand, probably higher than that, a thousand users in Couchbase Discord. So it's lots of Couchbase engineers in here, uh, customers, open source people, everyone using Couchbase. They can discuss technical questions, you know, roadmap questions, what, you know, any sort of questions you have for uh, Couchbase, Couchbase SDKs, Couchbase connectors, and so on. I would check out the Discord. So you like that it's open source, self-hosted container, your main priorities, okay. Else you don't care at this point, just try the technology out. So yeah, I would, I would suggest, uh, if you're gonna try it out, I would suggest trying the Enterprise Edition. Uh, if you're just, if you're just sort of testing, doing proof of concept, just trying it out. Enterprise Edition has all the features. It's uh, uh, it's a free download, right? You need a license to go into production, but you can, if you're just experimenting, proof of concept, whatever, you can do all that with the Enterprise Edition. There's also Community Edition, which is uh, uh, is the free version of Couchbase server. Not as full featured, it has some limitations in it, but you can deploy that anywhere you want to and use it, no licensing. We have to agree to the terms of service, but other than that, no licensing is uh, required for that. No purchasing of a license is required for that. And of course, yes, there is the open source, the BSL version, which you can compile yourself if you want to go through all that trouble uh, to do that. But yeah, lots of options there Docker. I'm using Docker uh, right now, actually, for these, for these tests. Um, and also for my integration test, spin up a Docker container, run the test, and then dispose the container. So lots of options there. But I'm glad uh, you're interested in trying it out. And uh, yeah, join the Discord. Let us know how it's going. Uh, it's always good to hear uh, positive things as well as the negative. Like, hey, why does this work this way? This is weird. Why don't you change this? Especially from people who are new to it. It's a, it's a great way for us to get feedback is someone trying it out for the first time. Because I've been using Couchbase for over seven years. So I take a lot of stuff for granted that uh, a fresh set of new eyes uh, can definitely bring to light a little better. Okay, so happy about that, that onion. Thank you. But I need to figure out why my tests aren't working or behaving the way I want them to. Is this actually being hit? Maybe I can just check that. Maybe there's, maybe that's not... Maybe that's chat GPT was incorrect. That's not being hit. Let's find out. Yep, it's being hit. That's just fine. Okay. 
Look at all these configuration sources. My goodness. Companies might have, hopefully, not have sensitive data. Hmm. So I wonder if it's skipping ahead to this part. But these all should be included as well. That wouldn't make sense, would it? Yeah, that's going to be a fail. Hmm. Pre-populated. But it seems to be getting all those dependencies from program. Hmm. Well, all I'm tempted to do right now is just kind of hard code it or just to, uh, oh gosh, I think it's going to work. Annoying, very annoying, because here's the thing. I know the test works. The test is going to pass. Um, like, my code is correct, right? It's just something with configuration that I've got to figure out the right combination here to make sure that this is using the integration test bucket. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. That doesn't really seem to be doing what I want. What is the problem? What do you say, Chat GPT? Did I miss something? Use the dynamic query series. Your series are specific to the Google's environment. Should be used for tests. Tests on different machines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Won't exist. Test specific secrets. Better to create a JSON file. Yeah, I don't know about that. Nonsense information. User secrets.json. Yeah, I don't I don't want to include a file. Hmm. What is this for? When env isn't used. Or is it used somewhere else? I'm just not noticing it. Oh yeah, that's right here. It's testing its development. Okay. Never mind. Ignore that. All right. Well, I, I can guess one thing I can try here. This is some hacky debugging, and I can't show a lot of it, so. I'm going to change the name here of the bucket in all these various configuration places so I know where it's pulling it from, because right now it's either conduit or conduit integration testing. So I just need to know where it's pulling it from so I can narrow this down. Uh, web secrets. Oh, crud. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> uh, ignore those. I don't think those work anyway, those credentials. What kind of projects do you use Couchbase for, if any? So, I mean, I am... 
uh, I'm an employee of Couchbase, right? So I'm building, uh, this is kind of a demo project with Couchbase for the real world conduit project, which I don't know if you caught that when I discussed it with Napalm uh, earlier. Um, yeah, I think, I think you were here for that. But uh, this is the kind of project that I'm building. I'm also building a couple other open source projects um, like NoSQL Migrator and uh, C Sharp Advent. So uh, for me, I like building web sites, web projects. So C Sharp Advent is one that I'm actually using Couchbase for. Not a particularly taxing use case for Couchbase. And Couchbase is used by companies like LinkedIn, for instance. Um, uh, United Airlines, so big publicly facing websites Couchbase is really great at, uh, and uh, and mobile as well. Just too many times developers don't use their own tools in the real world. Yeah, I, I strongly believe in, in dog fooding Couchbase. I've been using Couchbase to build stuff um, since uh, version 4.5, I believe, and we're on 7.2 right now. But yeah, uh, dog fooding is very important. Um, but uh, yeah, I, so C Sharp Advent is probably the closest thing to production that I have, but that's, again, not particularly taxing for Couchbase. Couchbase is, is very big scale here, so I can tell you about customers, at least the ones I can talk about publicly that use Couchbase. There's a whole list of them right here. So lots of different use cases. Um, Comcast is using us for what's called Customer 360. Domino's Pizza is using us for analytics and, and marketing stuff. Uh, Gannett is kind of the closest to what I'm building here today. They do a lot of content management. So they're all like USA Today and much regional newspapers. That's what Gannett is. Uh, LinkedIn, of course. Uh, Cis Cisco, yes, Cisco is using Couchbase. They're actually a customer from a long time back. They've been a long time Couchbase customer. Marriott, hotels. All right, did you work for Cisco? Is that why you, you mentioned that? PayPal, they've been a long-time customer of, Cal of uh, Couchbase. PepsiCo, uh, actually I was in uh, Wisconsin for the conference last week, and uh, the guy I was with, one of his clients is PepsiCo. Um, and also related to that, I think they're maybe separate companies, I'm not sure, but Yum Brands is also using a Couchbase, like Taco Bell, for instance. Um, hopefully I'm allowed to say that publicly. If not, disregard uh, you work for a small company. We play in some big circles these days. Yeah, and the thing is, there's lots of companies on here that are big names, but there's lots of them that are maybe ones you've not heard of. You know, startups, for instance. Uh, there's some, um, let's see. I, I got past them already, but... Uh, well, it used to be that Zynga was listed here, uh, the creators of a lot of mobile games. Uh, Jam City is another uh, mobile game company. They're using a couch base. Um... Yeah, lots of it. Seen it's a very interesting uh, kind of a smaller company, that video platform. That they're not hosting videos in Couchbase, but they're hosting all the metadata about the videos in Couchbase, and they do a lot of processing of videos to extract and create that metadata. So they're storing that in Couchbase. Very cool use case using text search there. Very interesting stuff. Shop.com goes way back with Couchbase. Yeah, lots of people and lots of very interesting customers on here that I can't talk about publicly. I wish I could. They're doing very cool stuff with Couchbase. Um, just one of the things we always say is, you know, on your mobile phone, you know, probably you're interacting with Couchbase all the time, every day, and uh, you, don't, you don't realize it. So Couchbase is often the, uh, the, the biggest uh, database that you've never heard of. Let's see, uh, it looks like it's holding one of your messages for censorship. Let me just check it real quick. I think that's fine, yeah. <laughs> uh, big companies hopping into open source circles now. So our company having been a big member in one of these circles does good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, lots of big companies going into open source. That's not a new trend, I don't think. They've been doing that for a while. Some companies are more conservative than others, of course, when it comes to open source, but lots of benefits to open source. Um, not just financial, which is what People sometimes look at it with open source like, oh, there's no licensing cost. We should definitely use it. Well, it's not as easy as that, right? Um, and uh, certainly companies like Amazon, for instance, um, who are kind of co-opting open source to create their own 
as a service versions, which I have mixed feelings about, right? For one, it increases adoption of that service, but for two, it, it, if, unless they're giving back to that project um, in some way, contributions, financial support, whatever, then it's just kind of a free rider issue, right? Which is why you see many open source companies switching their licenses to something that's a little more hostile to those situations, right? Uh, just for instance, like Elastic, Search one of our competitors, right? Uh, Amazon has their own version of Elastic that they host in AWS that uh, uses, I think uses Elasticsearch open source behind the scenes, maybe a modified version of that. But uh, of course, if someone goes to Amazon uh, instead of Elastic, you know, Elastic's the one spending a lot of the time uh, and, and money building Elasticsearch, but Amazon is, is reaping a lot of the benefits of that. Uh, and this is, I think there was a lawsuit uh, for this reason between Elastic and Amazon. I think I have those details right. I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, that's, that's tricky. That's a tricky area nowadays with open source. You want to be able to make things available for people to experiment with and contribute to. But you also want to open yourself up to you know, getting a rug pulled out from under you by Amazon or, uh, or whoever. Um, kind of just grabbing your work and, and not contributing in any way and, and, and benefiting from it financially, right? That's always a bummer. That's, that's been an issue with open source for years is how do you make it more, um, like it's, it's not in, it's inherently a non-capitalistic model, but yet we live in a capitalistic world. So how do you deal with, uh, how do you deal with that mismatch, right? Not easy, not easy at all, but uh, I think we're making progress there. Hopefully, hopefully we'll make progress there. <laughs> um, so anyway, I digress, which is fine. There's a lot of digression on this, uh, on this stream. I wanted to run my test again, and we'll set a breakpoint again in the data service to see where, where it's pulling that configuration from. Where's my breakpoint at? Right here? No. Get username by email. That was, I thought. Yeah, get user by email. Okay. Try it again. What in the heck? Not being tied to the cloud. Oh, did I run the web project by mistake? Not being tied to the cloud is a huge thing for our company. What do you mean by not being tied to the cloud? I'm curious, like you don't want to be on the cloud or you don't want to be tied to a specific cloud vendor? Like you don't want to, you don't want to be locked in or something like that. I'm kind of curious your opinion there. Because I find the cloud Despite the things I just said, cloud is very beneficial, right? Um, what in the world? Am I hitting the wrong button? What am I doing here? Debug. What in the world? Oh. Why is that a problem? Probably because I commented everything out. Uh. Mm. This is really a bummer. Because I, I, I'm running out of time. I, I want to get on another feature but I can't make this test pass. So I think what I'm going to be able to, I'm going to table this for now. I'm not going to commit anything. Um, I'm not going to move that card to done because it's not. I need to get that config working. So you're avoiding vendor lock-in in general. You're okay deploying wherever and whatever our clients want, but not our own component. Our own component list is mainly self-hosted. So when you say self-hosted, does that mean you have your own data center somewhere that you're managing? Um, and uh, and and if so, like uh, you know, that's 
I mean, if that's what your value proposition is, then that makes sense. But, you know, I, I, I think like the days of having your own data center, I mean, I think you've got to make the case for that. Where It used to be the default is, yeah, we have a, we have a data center room. We have servers in the closet over there. Right, but uh, I think you got to make the case for why you do that these days, and why not use a cloud provider or all the cloud providers. Right? I don't know what your company does, so maybe it totally makes sense for you to do that. You have your own data centers, okay? But you're also hosting cloud in case of high availability gains in some cases. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so you got a mixture. You're doing a hybrid type of deployment. Couchbase is great for that kind of situation because we can deploy to any cloud, right, with Capella. You can deploy it to your own data centers. And one of the things that Couchbase has, since you're just learning about Couchbase for the first time, is XDCR. This is cross data center replication. So this is automatic replication of data between data centers, right? So in your case, between clouds, between clouds and your own data centers, or any combination in between. And this replication happens automatically and immediately. Right, so I write a document into data center A, it gets copied over to data center B. And yes, GDPR is an issue with that, of course, if you've got data centers in Europe. Uh, so XDCR has some filtering capabilities to say, well, replicate this data, but don't replicate that data because it needs to stay in Europe for GDPR reasons. So if this is something you're looking for, something you're building at your company, uh, you still don't say the name of your company. That's totally fine. You don't have to if you don't want to. But um, XDCR might be something to help you there. This is uh, something that's been in Couchbase for a long time. And anything with synchronization, Couchbase really excels at. This is just one example of synchronization. There's also mobile uh, synchronization uh, for offline data. And uh, there's um, other sync gateway has its own kind of, uh, I won't say replication, but... Uh, uh, kind of like, uh, what's another word? What's the other word I'm looking for? Not replication, but synchronization between data centers as well. And there's subtle differences in those things. But anything with synchronization in Couchbase is really good at. Yeah, you're not trying to dock yourself. That's fine. That's cool, man. I, you don't have to say it. That's totally cool. Uh, but it uh, sounds like you're doing some interesting stuff there. That's for sure. All right, well, I'm stuck. I'm going to come back to that, but I want to go ahead and just get to work on the unfollow user, which is hopefully very quick. We can knock this out today because uh, it's just the reverse of follow user. Uh, so let's look at that issue. And so there is the endpoint there. I'm going to start from follows, controllers. And this is the follow endpoint. So I'm just going to straight up duplicate this. But I'm going to paste this spec right here for me to view. And because now I need a, not post, I need HTTP delete. And this is going to be, uh, it's the same API or the same, sorry, same URL, but I'm just using the delete verb there instead. So that's interesting. Unfollow a user, and I'll need to take the, not profile, but uh, I want to get this link right here to put in the docs. Okay, and this returns a profile, returns the unfollowed user's detailed profile information, and uh, unauthorized and user not found are also possibilities there. Let's unfollow user. No additional parameters required, so it's just the username. So the same stuff as before, but now I want to do an unfollow user request. And so over in the follows handlers, user request, again, I'm just going to straight up copy this. It's an unfollow user request, unfollow user result, user to unfollow. Uh, sure, whatever. 
No, 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 no. Don't change that. Okay. Uh, font user, that should say the same. And this will be user to unfollow. Do not do anything else. Don't mess with the tests. Okay. So I'll put this in its own file. Okay, I need to unfollow user result. So again, just going to copy this pretty much as is. You might say, well, why not reuse this? Might make sense right now, but in the future, it might not. This is different endpoint, different handler. So I want to keep it a different result. Many companies here in Finland are tied to Azure because old Nokia engineers were trained in the Microsoft ecosystem. Wow. You say old Nokia, engineer, Nokia engineers. Gosh, it just feels like yesterday that Microsoft acquired Nokia. Yikes, calling them old. But um, yeah, I, yeah, that makes sense. Tied to Azure. And I think there's, uh, there's, some, there's at least one data center, uh, Azure data center in Finland, right? Might be multiple. Probably for that reason, right? There was a, the whole Windows Phone thing was happening about the same time as Azure was really taking off. <laughs> yeah, I, maybe I'm maybe I'm one of those old engineers, right? If I if I think the Nokia, when did the Nokia acquisition happen? Acquisition Microsoft. 2014, it's almost 10 years ago. I am so old. <laughs> Holy cow, where has the time gone? Okay. Almost 10 years time flies, yeah. <clears throat> All right, I need a handler. Unfollow user, wait, let's do, let's do the handler here. Follow user handler. I'm just gonna copy this. We'll call it unfollow user handler. So I'm not using much chat GPT today, but I did build the follow endpoint almost exclusively with either Copilot or ChatGPT, I can't remember which, maybe both. And I, I made some small tweaks along the way, but that was the one or two episodes ago is when I did that, just a full build of, a, of an endpoint of a, of a slice of the application using ChatGPT from the controller down to the database and mixed results. Um, I, I would say, I would estimate if I had to 80%, of the code that ChatGPT wrote was exactly what I wanted. I, I think I actually used Copilot because Copilot was able to look at my existing code base and understand the patterns that I'm doing and follow those same patterns. So I think it was Copilot Chat. So I found that was really good for that. Uh, it, Copilot Chat in general is really good at seeing the context of your code. At least that's my impression of what it's doing. I don't know if it actually is. Uh, and then uh, constructing code that follows the same kind of patterns. So, okay, so we're going to unfollow, and I'm still calling the data service follow data service. This is all follow related data service, so that's fine. This needs to be an unfollow user request validator, because I don't have one for that yet, but we, I'll create one. And the validator, yeah, doesn't uh, have should be unfollow his request, unfollow his result, unfollow his request. Okay. Make sure the user already exists. So user to unfollow is what I should be pulling in there. Uh, this should be a new data service method called unfollow user, which doesn't exist yet. So you're in Finland, that onion, I assume. Are you a native Finn? Is that the right way to say it? Native Finlander? I don't know. 
I've never been to Finland, although I, and hopefully this doesn't cause any sort of international incidents. Native Finn. Okay, with two ends. All right. I am going on a cruise next summer uh, up the coast of Norway. So not Finland, of course, but uh, in the same kind of region of the world, I guess. So I'm looking very much forward to that. I don't think I'll be anywhere near Finland. Although I haven't booked any air travel yet. So maybe I'll fly into Finland for a connection. I'm not sure why I would do that, but uh, I'm not ruling it out. I was actually uh, chosen to be a speaker for NDC Oslo. Again, we're talking about Norway here. Not, I don't know much about Finland, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know much about Norway either, but I was chosen to be a speaker for NDC Oslo, which is a very prestigious event for Microsoft-oriented .NET developers, and just developers in general. Super excited about it, so happy. Because uh, I don't go to Europe that much anyway, and this is a great conference, so I've heard. I was suggested, selected as a speaker in 2020. Yes. So excited to go to NDC Oslo in 2020, but no one went that year in person. We did an online event, which they tried, but uh, online events just aren't the same as an in-person event. So it was still a very, on a very great honor to be included there. So I was still happy about that. All right, so profile, view, yep, all that stuff, following. Oh, okay, and following is always going to be false in this case, right, because I'm always unfollowing that user. Uh, it should be unfollow user result. Unfollow. Unfollow. You know, this actually might have been, it's not that much typing, but it might have been, interesting exercise to paste this into GitHub Copilot and say, change this follow to unfollow. Because, you know, there's some refactoring tools I can, I can do, but not quite as efficient as pasting it into chat TP. That's interesting. Might, might want to try that some other time. Uh, so follow data service right here. I've got an unfollow user. Uh, so Paste that right here, unfollow user, user to unfollow. And I'm not going to add from the set, I want to remove. Okay. Everything else I think is still good. Yeah, alrighty. So I think that's it, that's the, that's the whole code. Uh, I don't have any tests for it yet, of course, but uh, that's the whole of the code there, whole of the feature. So, great. And it's got the documentation already, so that's good. And I suspect the tests will be very similar as well. Push it to prod, yeah. <laughs> I don't have a prod per se just yet, uh, but I do have uh, a CI build going on, which will fail because of that issue that I tabled with the configuration strings. So. Uh, it's going to be the same issues here with this. But I can at least create a unit test right before shutdown for the day. Uh, and so I'm just going to do a copy and paste again. Maybe I'll try it here. Unfollow user handler test. I'll try it here. Okay. Um, in this code, everywhere... Everything that says, says follow should now become unfollow, except for the follow data service or I follow data service. Let's see what happens. What did it do to my, why did it highlight it like this? Ah, it's burning my eyes. All right, once this unit test is passing, I'm going to wrap it up for the day uh, because I can't push to GitHub yet because of that config issue. I will tackle that issue maybe while I'm on the road this week in Michigan, which is I'll be leaving tomorrow for Detroit, and then the next day I'll be in Lansing, and then next day back in Detroit, and then I'll be going to Grand Rapids for Beer City Code to end out the tour and then back home 
on Saturday. Yeah, yeah, it's like the old days of traveling, uh, getting back up to those levels. But I uh, haven't been to Michigan uh, in a while, so looking forward to it. All right, so here is the transform code. Let's see. Just paste it in, see what happens. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't change the name of the class? Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay. Uh, it didn't change the name of the handler. Did it do anything? I don't think it did anything. Well, okay. Didn't quite work. Let's try ChatGPT then. Uh, rename every... Let's just do the same prompt. What was it? here. Okay, just take that code there, or that prompt there, and paste it here. Hello? Maybe not. Copy. Okay, so this is actually something I want to explore after I get this conduit project done. This is kind of a minor version of it, but uh, let's, re let's go back to what it was before. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, not so much like this minor refactoring sort of thing. Just copy this from here. But um, more significant refactors that a refactoring tool couldn't do. So, for instance, if I wanted to take a project that is using, say, Postgres, or Oracle, and convert it something using Couchbase. Like, how feasible is that? How much work would that be? Um, or how much how much time would it save using ChatGPT or Copilot to do that? So ChatGPT seems doing a better job at it. Yeah, these are all unfollows, unfollow. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So. That seems to be working better than Copilot for whatever reason. You think Copilot would be fine at that? It would be really good at that. I, one of the things I'm learning from doing all this is that, you know, maybe multiple LLMs is the way to go. Um, like some sort of LLM aggregator that would post the same question, the same prompt to multiple tools and get back the results. I wonder if Copilot could translate a piece of software to another language easily. You want to try it? We'll, we'll try a function. Let's just try one function. Translate it to another language. So, okay. This is tricky, though, because whatever language you're using, add async is always going to be add async, right? So what are we actually translating? The function name? The parameter names? What would you expect to happen there? So uh, what is the... So I know English is a popular language in Finland. What's another popular language in Finland? What's, is, it, is it Finnish? Is that another popular language? Translate this code to be readable by someone who only reads Finnish. Let's try that prompt. Let's see what Copilot has to say. Because it, it, okay, see, this is what I expected. This is a problem because this might be the correct translation. I don't know. I don't read Finnish, but that's not the name of the function. <laughs> so, um, <what laughs> I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like, what would you, like, if you wanted to translate this into Finnish, I would translate the function name, possibly the parameter names, and any variable names. So maybe that's what I have to do. I have to prompt it like that. Uh, let's try this. Finish uh, only change um, function names, method names, parameter names, and variable names. And let's paste the code in there and see if it can handle that. So I got to be more specific. That's another thing I've learned from these LLMs is you got to over specify. Ah, okay, so it still changed the method. Ah, because I said method names, didn't I? Okay, 
so that's not correct. Try a different prompt. Uh, translate this code. We change function function declaration names method declaration names parameter names variable names yeah let's try that oh, it's oh, still doing it okay so I, I did change the method name declaration that's that's good change these parameter names that's good change the, these names but it's changing this name and this name here and this this is not what I wanted to change Um, but I, I think I think with enough time and enough uh, prompt engineering, we could probably get something that works. So yeah, I think the answer is yes. This might be a good way to translate um, translate code. Yeah, of course the program language is English, right? C sharp is English. Uh, mixing English and Finnish is a bit it's a bit weird, but I, I mean I think fin Finland is an exception because I think. Clearly, that onion, if you are representative of the Finnish population, you have an excellent grasp of the English language, and this would not be a problem for you. Um, but let's say uh, we're not talking Finnish. Let's, let's say we're talking, uh, I don't know, uh, Portuguese or Spanish. Right? Uh, they, they may not have a good of grasp as English because they're speaking um, mostly Portuguese and Spanish in, the, in their home countries. So if you wanted to take an English bit of code, uh, a sample from a Stack Overflow or a blog or whatever, and translate that into Spanish so that you know what they're actually trying to do in that code. Because, Or even just translate the comments, right? That's more of a Google Translate job anyway. But uh, yeah, translating the code. That would be a very helpful thing, I think, for a lot of developers. So I think you're onto something there. It's a good idea. We can work on a prompt for that maybe another time. But, uh, you know, I have a copilot, I have access to copilot chat because I uh, MVP, so I'm not, it's not an extra charge for me. And I have access to chat GPT uh, that Couchbase is kind enough to uh, cover for the express purpose of building this application. So uh, I have chat GPT for access. So if anyone uh, ever in the future wants to try some prompts and doesn't have access, doesn't want to pay for the monthly fees, happy to try this, happy to learn more about uh, LLMs, and uh, if you have prompts you want to try, happy to try those on the stream in the future. So There are a lot of things to learn from projects behind the language barrier. I think you're absolutely correct. And it could go the other way. I mean, there's some great code being written in Portuguese and Spanish, and um, you know that's a barrier for me because I don't read those at all. But maybe there's a very cool project that's completely in Spanish that I don't know about because um, I, I don't understand Spanish. So I should learn Spanish, probably. <laughs> I took some in high school, um, but uh, I haven't learned it. So Certainly, uh, Google Translate's been around for a while, Babelfish, things like that. But this is a little different, right? Because we're translating selective parts of it, uh, of the code. So, anywho, um, what, was I, what was I doing here? Unit test, right? Yeah, so ChatGPT gave me a uh, class here. Let's see if it works. Unfollow user handler tests. Um, so that's not the right namespace. So another thing I didn't put in was uh, don't change the namespaces, but that's okay. No change here. Well, this is interesting. It added little comments. No change here. Why did it change certain things, not the others? Binary Chef, I took Spanish in high school and gave it back. <laughs> I, I mean, the problem is, you know, I learned a lot of Spanish, but I never knew anybody outside of class that would speak Spanish. So I never practice it. Uh, I, I made an attempt a couple of years back to find a conversation partner, someone from Colombia, I think it was, to try to learn. And he wanted to learn English, so we had like a little conversation going, but we never really got in a good rhythm with that. 
And uh, I think I think really immersion. Like you can learn Spanish theory in classrooms, right? But you really need to be immersed, uh, having a friend or living in a place where Spanish is spoken on a regular basis. You know that that's like a lot of baseball players in the United States. They learn Spanish, um, and they are immersed. And a lot of the players in their team are from Dominican Republic or uh, Mexico or uh, Colombia, Venezuela, and they sp all speak Spanish. So it's a very helpful tool, and you get immersed in it. So you have uh, programming classes for kids age 10 and up. Interesting to see what language they use. I started learning. I didn't take any classes. I went to a rural school. I didn't take any classes until my junior year. Of high school? Ugh. It's probably not the case anymore. This was a long time ago. As we've established already, I'm very old. <laughs> so I went to a rural school, and I'm old, so we had like two total programming classes, and I had already mastered them before I even came into the classes because it was just basic programming. And then we had typing classes, uh, which I took because I wanted to be in the computer lab. Uh, typing, I completely... I was like the number one or number two fastest typer in this whole school, which... Again, I did not find to be a challenge, so I had plenty of time to use those computers in the typing uh, class to write code in. So that was my kind of back door into uh, coding in school. Typing was totally ineffective on me. Maybe I had a really good instructor, a really good um, uh, curriculum. I, 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 uh, I did not know touch typing before I started these classes, but after you know uh, a couple months, I was... 70 words a minute, no problem. And with, with accuracy. Right? Went to University of Applied Science in 2015, knowing nothing about computers, but computers seemed cool. You didn't know anything about computers in 2015? <laughs> Were you living under the Finnish equivalent of a rock? <laughs> you had to have a phone. Like, you had to have a web browser. You know something about computers. I'm sure you did. You probably didn't know anything about, like, the low-level details of how a processor works. That's, you know, whatever. You knew how to play Half-Life. Well, there you go. That's all you need to know. Just, you know, what's it What's it called? The uh, Just watch out for, uh, what was it called? Cascade something or other? Cas the resonance Cascade. Yeah, just watch out for the Resonance Cascade. No problem. <laughs> all right. Um... So I haven't created this class yet, but I do need to create one, so that's good. Not sure what that's all about. Oh, uh, this needs to be in the yeah hand uh, yeah follows namespace. Yep, yep, that's good, that's good. No change here. I don't know why you need to tell me there's no change here, but whatever. I'd rather you point out where the changes were. I guess I could ask for that. If you asked me what a GPU was, I would have known it runs my Half-Life. I assume you mean Half-Life 2, right? Because Half-Life is old. <laughs> Older than a Nokia acquisition. I am not so much into Half-Life, but I am way into Portal. Love me some Portal. I wish, I wish there was another Portal game. Love some Portal. Uh, possibly, in my opinion, possibly the best game of all time. Portal 2. I know that's saying a lot, but it's such a tremendous game. So innovative. It's a great story. Uh, sound design, voice acting, everything. Fantastic. Yeah, Valve hates the number three. So maybe no Portal 3 either. You know, if you look at uh, Half-Life Alex, the VR, uh, non-Half-Life 3 game, a, a lot of that kind of plays like, you know, you kind of portal from one part of the room to the other. I mean, that's just how the controls work, so... It kind of feels like a Portal VR game would be good. <laughs> they made a demo too, I think, a, a Portal flavored VR demo for uh, Steam VR or whatever it's called, which is, again, fantastic game, but just like really short, like a you know, 20 minute game. Anywho, unfollow user. This service, this is uh, follow. Isn't there an unfollow? Oh, I bet I didn't add it to the interface. Yeah, I didn't. Unfollow user, user to unfollow. 
Okay, there it is. Request dot. Just should be user to unfollow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, and that's the first test. In the city skylines here, but I'm weird. I don't know what city skylines is. Sorry. I'm not, uh, you know, I guess you could call me a person who likes video games, but I am, uh, you know, like everybody, I buy a bunch of stuff on Steam sales and never play it. <laughs> SimCity on steroids. Man, I, was, I played a lot of SimCity back in the day on SNES and on PC. I played so much. What is this? Expected validation errors? It's not used anywhere. Follow user handler test. Huh. Well, that's weird. Why do I have this code in here that's not being used? Okay. Weird. Just comment it off for now. Okay. Got a bug in here. I have over 100 Steam titles and I play like half a dozen of them. So my addiction is adventure games. That's uh, my purchasing addiction is adventure games. I, I love point and click adventure games from Sierra, LucasArts, and so on. So whenever those go on sale, like Monkey Island or remasters or sequels or reboots or whatever, I'm always... Picking them up, but never playing them. I actually used to play them on Twitch here uh, way back in the day. Uh, probably Nokia acquisition time. Um, with my brother, we'd play online on, on Twitch. we kind of collaborate adventure games. We played Gabriel Knight, which is probably my favorite adventure game. Um, I think we played something else. And then maybe Surly Dev was around for this. When I did, uh, I started to try to play adventure games from like the very beginning and we played a game called wizard and the princess and it's just this terrible terrible game <laughs> steam has become the udemy of the gaming industry <laughs> I, I it's basically the default store right i mean everyone has epic installed for fortnite, fortnite right and the free games there but yeah steam is kind of the default i think the only ones i haven't given into steam are the console creators, Xbox and Nintendo and PlayStation. They're not putting anything on Steam. But maybe they will eventually. It'd be pretty cool, huh? Have an Xbox or something that can play Steam games as well. Or Switch. You could download any Steam game onto your Switch. That'd be pretty rad. Yeah, Nokia acquisition is the is the new epic. <laughs> we're, we're changing from January 1st, 1970. Uh, we're changing the epoch to uh, Nokia, Nokia, Nokia Acquisition Day. <laughs> That's how we solve the, the epoch uh, overflow problem. <laughs> yeah. Binary Chef, exactly. You you get the game on Epic for free. Uh, if you bought it already on Steam, it's like, ah, oh, darn it, I shouldn't have. But then I never never play it. <laughs> Only games I play anymore are Jackbox, and that's when like I have family and friends over. We play some Jackbox games off Steam, but everything else just goes unplayed. Sadly, okay. Well, these are all the tests that basically Chat GPT kind of wrote for us. I don't have this validator yet. I need to create that. Uh, follow user request validator. It's not much to this, so unfollow user request validator. Unfollow. Okay. Get that's on file. Okay, let's just run these tests and see how badly they fail. Or which ones pass, which ones don't. These are mostly chat GPT generated, kind of it's renamed. Okay, so we have one that failed. Uh, this is probably because something I didn't expected profile. Yep. Be false because we're unfollowing. So look at that. 
pretty good. Except for one tweak, chat GPT, completely, I'm not going to say generated, but it took my existing tests that were very close and just renamed them. Very nice. Saved me a lot of time. I don't know what this is here. I'm going to figure out why is this here. I can't type. <laughs> Why, why was this here? And this is also in the, over here. Uh, wait, uh, follow user handler test. Yes, good job, GPT. And for whatever reason, GitHub Copilot couldn't handle it. So that's weird. It's weird to see the things that Copilot can do and ChatGPT can do and vice versa. Why is this here? I don't know why this is here. Validation failure. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. what. Maybe it's some code that I started typing and forgot about. I don't know. Need to deal with that. So anyway, I think I'm going to call it a day for that. Um, let's just go look at the project. So um, this is really kind of, this, this feature is kind of done. I just have some issues with my integration test and CI build. I need to figure out the configuration for that. Get that uh, figured out. Same with Git profile, but these are basically done and they're already documented. So we're good there. Um, the next thing I need to work on, this might be actually included in this is the whole idea of, uh, well, this is not really related, but the, uh, some of those, uh, JWT, if you look at auth service, this stuff right here, these issuers and audiences and security tokens, this stuff is all hard coded in here. And it really shouldn't be. This should be refactored out. I'm thinking of using that somewhere else, in fact. Yeah, I think that's in the in the program. Right, uh, right here. So it's in two places, um, which is kind of, you know, this needs to be refactored to use the same strings. But those also should be configured by app settings or user secrets or GitHub secrets, something like that. It shouldn't be hard coded in here. So that's what that uh, ticket is for. Maybe I'll work on that one next. It's kind of a boring one, but it needs to be done. Uh, and, and so um, in the process, I can figure out this configuration business as well with, uh, with the controller tests. But that's it for today. I thank you all for joining me. Some great conversation. Thank you for the follow, Salty Fire Buff. I know you're not around, but thank you anyway. Thank you, the, uh, That Onion, for a great conversation. I'm super excited that you're going to check out Couchbase some more. Uh, Pcrum73, thank you for the follow. Uh, KB2050 also followed uh, while I was offline, so thank you very much for the follow. Also, Dai Varath, D-A-I-V-R-A-T-H, thank you. Sira Shupa, thank you for the follow. And Pavlo Chenko, I-N-D. Thank you very much for the follow, everybody. I'm glad you're here. I'm going to go and raid somebody else on the live coders team. Um, we've got a pretty sizable audience here, so we're going to give someone a nice little little raid. Who should we uh, look at here? Uh, Paragon stream. That's not English. Uh, this one looks interesting. Sir Linux Van Freech. Just that onion for the sub. Oh man. So great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I hope we'll see you in the next stream, which might be this Friday. Might not be. Just FYI. This looks like it's not English as well. Tim Boudot. Rated Tim Boudot before recently, but we'll put that as a maybe. Tomcat is, I think, a game developer. I'm not sure if he's playing a game or working a game, but let's go and raid Tim Boudot. I hope you'll join me over there. Uh, give Tim Boudot some love, or Boudet. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. But I'll see you over there, and maybe I'll see you on Friday. If not, I'll see you next Tuesday, same place, Twitch. And uh, I hope you all have a great week. And I'll see you over there on Tim's channel as soon as the raid is ready to go. Goodbye, everybody.